Um, so a little while ago on one of my, well, on several of my Facebook support community groups, um, there's always people that are asking about plea cajure. So usually when people start rumbling about a, a technique that I'm not, that's not my forte, then I go in search of uh, educational material on that particular technique that I can um, t pass you over to um, to learn that technique. So when I started looking for information about plique jour, I was really astounded at how little there is out there uh, available for people to read about. Um, and I, I found a few little things. Um, quite a bit of it didn't really jive with my experience with uh, plique jour, uh, as particularly the older information. So, and I'm thinking the information that was um, prevalent before Valery Timofeev came from Moscow and um, and started showing the people in the United States how he and other traditional Russian enamelists did plique jour. Um, the, before that time, there was just so much misinformation about how plique jour was actually made. It was this like, secretive thing. And then Valeri just blew the whole thing wide open. So prior to Valeri coming, I had tried um, firing flat pieces of plique jour on mica uh, that I had um, clamped onto mica with little iron binding wire pins. Um, and I had tried um, using copper foil. And I had tried using heavier copper, uh, using copper foil and peeling it off after it was fired, and then I'd had used heavier copper and made forms with it, and then built lattice work out of fine silver and gold uh, that I placed on top of that copper, and then used acid to remove that copper. And um, I got a hold of a thesis that was written by the grandson of David Anderson in Norway, who um, his grandfather had been um, president of the David Anderson firm when those fabulous plique pieces were made by Gustav Gaudernack at the turn of the last century, 1900. Um, and in his thesis, he said, number one, that those big bowls were built in pieces, flat and enameled, and then they were soldered together. The panels of them were soldered together. Well, I'm sure that's not how they were made. And then the other thing he said was that the, uh, the cells were backed by platinum foil and then the platinum was peeled off. Well, I kind of like that better than the copper foil idea because platinum doesn't stick to enamel very well, especially if it's highly polished. Uh, it's pretty malleable, so I could um, make platinum foil and then uh, press it into the back sides of the cells and get a nice concave surface on the, on the glass. Um, but it still was not, a, and, and I could also do formed pieces with the platinum foil. So in other words, a piece with a dome or something I could do with a platinum foil. But none of it was, was very satisfactory. And then there was always glass that was on the front, glass that was on the back that got fired onto the metal surfaces because the glass would sneak in between the mica and the metal or in between the copper foil and the metal or the platinum and the metal. And so at one point, 
after grinding off the excess glass that was on there, instead of laying it back down on the mica or uh, some other thing, I put it in a trivet and fired it in a, in a kiln unsupported. And it worked. So um, now I haven't done a lot of plea cassure, so I, I didn't really take it much farther than that. I just used the mica or the foil, made my pieces, and then did the final firing unsupported. Um, and that, that worked and, you know, there was no such thing as the internet, so we weren't really sharing information about stuff like that. I, everybody was kind of on their own doing their own thing. And, um, and then Valeri shows up, I think about 2003, something like that, and um, starts teaching in the United States. Well, lo and behold, he fired unsupported, the whole thing. He fired the whole thing unsupported, never laid it down on a backing. Um, and it's the capillary attraction on the pieces that make this all work. And it's so much more, it's so much easier than trying to back it with something and then get that something off of there and then clean it all up. It's, it really is a pretty great way to do it. Well, I would have been really happy if, if I had found um, uh, more information on the internet and in books that I could send you guys out to. So the few things that I did find, um, so Mayor Amalgro in Belgium uh, just did a short uh, video on Plicajour that's very good. And um, Laura Ginsberg is currently working on a uh, Plicajour workshop uh, that'll be filmed and available. And, and she has done a lot of Plicajour. And um, Amy Roper Lyons, I had scheduled to come and teach here um, but because of COVID, we had to cancel that. But um, there's not a lot of information about how Amy does what she does that's, that's been documented that I could find. Um, uh, and, the, the, and then there is a article in Karen Cohen's book that's written by Diane Almeida um, that I think is, is probably the uh, most comprehensive and Diane's approach um, is, is kind of similar to mine as far as the way that we do things. So um, at any rate, th that's all I found. That's all I found out there was those few little tidbits of stuff. Um, one that just came out, one that's gonna come out, and, um, and then this one two, two three page excerpt in Karen Cohen's book, that's it. 